I don't see anything. So, uh, Ramiz, thank you for your, um, your patience. Um, so you have the floor if you make some opening remarks, and then we'll take your questions. Uh, thank you very much, Stephen. And uh, I hope I'm audible from Kabul. Um, very happy to uh, provide a briefing on the humanitarian situation on the ground. And indeed, uh, the economic shocks um, which we're experiencing uh, these days are the primary drivers of the humanitarian need. Since last August, we have seen 20% reduction in income, in incomes and in output, 65% reduction in public state spendings, and 50% decline in households receiving remittances. Um, the continued uh, humanitarian, economic, and human rights companion of issues characterizes a, a very difficult situation in Afghanistan. Uh, if, uh, Cost of the baskets of essential has risen 30%, and it forces poor, poorer households to go deep in debt to sell off assets just to survive or to go to the negative coping strategies. Uh, now we have a winter coming upon us, and uh, with the winter coming and temperatures dropping in certain areas of the country to uh, minus 25 Celsius, sometimes lower, specifically uh, vulnerable places are such provinces as Bamiyan, Ghazni, Nuristan, Vardak, and Paktia. And uh, the, these freezing temperatures, usually Afghanistan is known for its harsh uh, harsh winters, uh, imposes on us the need to prioritize our winterization programs. Uh, we have identified more than 369 high um, and uh, medium priority districts, so 122 are high priority, 247 medium priority districts in all of the 34 provinces. Uh, we require 768 million to support winter preparedness activities, uh, and uh, 614 million are required before the end of the year. And for the first quarter of 2023, we need 154 million. Um, honestly speaking, uh, we've been struggling for the funding for the entire year. Um, our humanitarian response plan is only nearly 50% funded, between 48 to 49 percent, and um, uh, it's uh, 2.1 billion we have raised against uh, nearly 4.4 billion dollars we needed. So, uh, in terms of our response, uh, as you know, last winter through a large effort we. But we prevented uh, the famine in the country. We prevented uh, the worst case scenario. But this winter ain't going to be easier. Honestly speaking, the number of the people in need have risen. If it, last year we were speaking about the 20 million, now we're talking more than 25 million people are in need uh, of various forms of humanitarian assistance. Levels of food insecurity remain about uh, one of the highest globally. Um, yeah, and by about 6 million people will be experiencing what we call emergency levels of food insecurity. In terms of going uh, ongoing response, uh, we have um, uh, provided um, through in-kind, meaning food and cash, um, uh, at least one round of food assistance in October. More than 10 million people were reached. Heating, uh, winter, and cloth, uh, clothes and blankets were provided to 92,000 households. Uh, more than uh, 693 metric tons of medical kits were provided to over 300 facilities. And uh, um, treatment for some of 19,000 most acutely malnourished children and pregnant and lactating women was provided. Um, well, another challenge in winter times, of course, is going around and about the country. The road infrastructure is not superior. Uh, with the snow uh, coming in, navigating some of those roads, uh, accessing the remote areas is becoming more, um, uh, more difficult. So that's why the prepositioning is extremely important before the end of the year, as the roads will be blocked. Cash assistance, which is a, also an important mode of response, is being applied whenever uh, uh, possible. Um, so to summarize, a two-third of the population are in need of humanitarian assistance in 2023. Droughts and economic shocks have taken over the conflict as the main drivers of the humanitarian needs. 
Um, humanitarian needs are high, at least in 30 out of 34 provinces, uh, not just for food and uh, health services, but also for quality of water, reflecting two consecutive years of drought. And um, this is a third uh, triple deep La Nina syndrome. Afghanistan is the sixth uh, most vulnerable country in the world to the uh, to the climate change, and, and that makes an important contribution to the situation. That's all in terms of the um, in terms of the brief overview or introduction uh, to the situation. I will be very happy to answer any questions. Uh, over to you, Stefan. For questions, uh, first question goes to Edie. Uh, <clears throat> thank you very much, Ramiz, on behalf of the United Nations Correspondents Association. Thank you for doing this briefing. My name is Edith Lettera from the Associated Press. Um, I have two questions. First of all, um, what has the Taliban governing body as a whole done to actually help their own people. And secondly, um, has any of the frozen U.S. money uh, come into Afghanistan, um, which is supposed to go directly to help the people and not through the government. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, when it comes to the de facto administration of Afghanistan and uh, type of assistance they are providing uh, to the population, um, I could speak, for instance, of the earthquake zone response, uh, where they have been providing an airlifting uh, and deployed the assets which they had to relocate um, the people during the earthquake, uh, specifically those who were wounded or have received, uh, um, uh, let's say, or had uh, a need to be relocated to uh, for the medical assistance to the uh, to the nearby districts. Uh, we do not have a detailed description, unfortunately, of uh, the budget of the state budget and how it is being distributed. Um, it has not been published by the de facto administration. We know that the national budget is planned at $2 billion uh, with a deficit of $1 billion. Uh, we uh, know that they've been supporting programs targeted uh, disadvantaged families such as orphans. They've been uh, pushing lately in the, recent, uh, in the recent months. We have seen some evidence of them pushing on the uh, ban uh, on uh, poppy growing and, and destroying the poppy fields. Uh, by and large, I would, however, say that uh, the Taliban uh, de facto administration of Afghanistan lacks the required resources to address uh, the pressing needs uh, of population in all sorts of assistance and uh, internationally provided funds uh, remain to be an important, uh, I would say, critical element to address humanitarian needs, but also to sustain essential services, such as health services specifically. Uh, when it comes to the frozen U.S. money, uh, I presume you are referring to the uh, assets. Uh, um, and um, as far as I know, uh, this is being discussed as part of uh, the fund, which has been set up in Geneva. Um, we, as United Nations, do not receive or distribute any of those funds. And uh, as far as I know, these funds are not earmarked uh, for any type of humanitarian assistance. Uh, this is largely a fiscal, uh, as far as I understand, a fiscal, uh, fiscal instrument to provide for the uh, macroeconomic stability. And uh, I'm not aware of any disbursement which has been made to the date from that fund. I, I just uh, a couple of days ago that they had their first meeting. So um, that's definitely not something I can further comment on. I hope I answered your question. Um, Thank you. Yeah, just a, a quick follow-up on something else you said. You said six million people were at emergency levels of uh, humanitarian needs. Um, how, how close and how soon do you see the possibility of Afghans uh, starving 
as a result of a lack of uh, resources and uh, food availability. I cannot make a prediction, but basically when we talk about 6 million people, we are talking about the people in the uh, IPC4. That is uh, the stage before you go to the phase five. And the phase five is basically a catastrophic famine stage. So six million people are uh, getting close to that, to that particular border line, if you wish. So unless we receive the prioritized funding and respond, um, Afghans are resilient people, but uh, quite a number of those who uh, will not receive the assistance uh, will uh, move into the category uh, five, in the phase five. Now, last year we were able to avert any occurrence of that. When the snows melted in spring of this year, uh, we found only a couple of very remote communities uh, in, in one of the provinces which we were not able to reach. So every effort will be exercised by us to avoid such situation this year as well. However, our funding levels were uh, lower than last year. And uh, uh, unless the prioritized requirements are met, uh, then uh, the forecast will be commensurate with the scale of funding available. I hope I answered your question. Thanks. Uh, Maryam? Um, thank you so much for um, the briefing today. Um, my name is Maryam Ramadi, Afghanistan International. Um, UNIMA requested a couple of days ago that um, the neighboring country's ambassadors uh, prepare for a, uh, Im an important meeting in Kandahar. Um, and um, that uh, the reports by the media um, indicated that the goal for this meeting is negotiation with the Taliban. Um, can you tell us um, who are these delegates are going to meet up with? Because you never, um, UNAMA never announced that. Why is this meeting in Kandahar first, and who is going to be the, in that and present in that meeting? Um, and do you think really negotiation with the Taliban is going to work as it didn't um, do anything in the past? Not in Doha, not in Afghanistan. They don't even like really cooperate with UNAMA. Um, if you can just tell me a little bit more about this meeting. And then I have a second question. Thank you. Uh, thank you very much uh, for your question. Um, I do not think there is any negotiations being conducted uh, in uh, Kandahar or in any other place. I think all the visits or uh, whatever the contacts are taking place are in the context of uh, discussing uh, the aspects of support in the area of basic human needs of the people of Afghanistan. And uh, this is what is being discussed. At this particular time, there is no confirmation or the date of the visits or any, any further details about that. That definitely has nothing to do with the political negotiations and, uh, and basically is concentrated around basic human needs, uh, such as health, uh, or education and our needs which need to be provided. So um, I think uh, there's a lot of speculations maybe in media uh, about uh, about visits or, or possible meetings which may or may not take place, but in the actuality there's no negotiations going on of any sort. Uh, it's mostly about providing aid to the people uh, specifically in the area of basic human needs. Um, so uh, you're saying that UNAMA did not request from the neighboring ambassadors to come to Kandahar for this visit? Uh, I am saying that nobody has requested anyone to go anywhere to conduct any negotiations. Uh, if the visit takes place, this is in the context of uh, the uh, provision of assistance to the people of Afghanistan. Um, okay. Um, that didn't quite answer my question, but um, um, I, I'm sure it that is there is reason. a reason. <laughs> yes, no but reason. if you have any follow-up question, please ask. Yes, I'm just saying that th there is a meeting that's um, going to take place um, place in December 5th, and that has been confirmed. And UNAMA had requested these ambassadors um, that uh, you didn't deny it. 
that's all I want to know, that there was a request and there is going to be a meeting, but you're not sure when it's going to take place. Did I understand it correctly? I'm not, I'm, not sure, I'm not sure when and in which format the meetings will take place. But what is happening, we are trying to have a closer dialogue with uh, the countries in uh, surrounding Afghanistan uh, for the specific purpose of strengthening provision of the basic human needs assistance to the people of Afghanistan. It has nothing to do with political negotiations or any other negotiations which you referred to in, your, uh, in, your, in the question you asked. But I don't have any further details on, on, on the meetings planned in Kandahar. Okay, thank you That's so cool. much. Um, so, my second question. Uh, Betul? Thanks, Farhan. Thank you very much for this briefing. This is Betul Yuruk with the Turkish News Agency, Anadolu. Uh, when you engage with the Taliban authorities, I'm wondering if you are raising the issue for fundamental human rights for women and girls, and what are you hearing from them? And uh, because just recently, Taliban has banned women parks, gyms in Afghanistan, uh, and further excluding them from public life. Uh, what we have seen so far uh, has been the deterioration for uh, the basic human rights for women and children. What are you hearing from the Taliban? And what has the UN done so far? Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, UN remains to be uh, the main uh, present body in Afghanistan from the international community. And in every single meeting we had with Taliban de facto administration of Afghanistan since the August 15, 2021, we have raised the issues of girls' education, women's rights, and uh, women's empowerment and participation. We have done so in every single meeting any of our officials have had with any representative of the Taliban de facto administration. Not only we have done it in every meeting, every time when we go into any meeting, half of our delegation is comprised by women who speak themselves and address these matters. Whenever we can, we also integrate Afghan women into these meetings. Uh, furthermore, you are asking uh, what is the reaction uh, on, on various elements of women's rights and women participation in Afghanistan. I think it is a part of very strong uh, debate which the Taliban has from inside. It is uh, uh, something the people of Afghanistan demand. They demand women's rights, they demand their access to education, they demand their access to work and, and all other aspects. I would rather say that in the area of economic engagement and economic empowerment, we have better understanding with the de facto administration representatives that when it comes to other uh, instances which you referred uh, uh, to in your question. Uh, I uh, can only assure you that we, as uh, the United Nations family in Afghanistan, will continue to advocate and raise the voice most strongly to make sure that the Afghan women have their rightful place in the society and um, be given the rights uh, uh, they deserve. Thank you. Can I just have a quick follow-up? Uh... Just to clarify, uh, you just said that it's a part of the strong debate which Taliban has uh, from inside. Is that the impression uh, you uh, have got from the Taliban? They have been talking about it and they're, they've been trying to improve it. Uh, is it something you have heard from them or just an impression you, you got from the Taliban authorities? I don't uh, need to uh, refer an impression to them. You can look at what is happening in various provinces. In more than 10 provinces, I believe by now the girls' schools are open and uh, the girls are attending. There is also uh, restrictions on, on how the women move uh, in, uh, or wherever they attend uh, the workplace, the public workplace, and insofar varies from one province to another, from one place to another. Uh, so uh, I cannot say that they are speaking with one voice on this particular matter, or they are all uh, speaking to the same, uh, to the same, uh, let's say, interpretation of uh, what is being made uh, as uh, as the general announcement. So, uh, it is uh, a very diverse country, a very diverse situation from one province to another, from one geographical location to another, 
And uh, I do believe that uh, we need to continue to engage in a dialogue with the uh, de facto authorities in order to uh, secure and to provide uh, the protection, if you wish, and uh, the continued advocacy for the women's rights to be in the rightful place and not to be uh, denied in the way they often are being denied in uh, through all these announcements or the practices uh, being promoted, like those you referred to regarding the parks, the gyms, or uh, very well discussed and known the issue of the girls' access to the education, uh, to the secondary education. Thank you. <clears throat> Frankie Ziardo from Terra 2 World, thank you for doing this. Uh, first of all, how long have you been in your position there? Very much. Uh, I'm uh, about two and a half years, approaching soon my uh, third year here. During, two and a half years. During that period of time, how much of an erosion of women's rights have you seen and witnessed? I have visited consistent erosion of the women's rights. To what degree? Uh, I cannot give you a, a degree from 1 to 100, but definitely a considerable erosion of the women's rights uh, has been observed specifically uh, starting from the March of the last year, where we have anticipated the opening uh, of this year, sorry, when we're uh, anticipating opening of the schools. And unfortunately, there was a, a downward trend which we have seen from uh, the end of March from 2021 to the date. I would say in the last particularly eight months of the year, we have seen uh, a quite consistent deterioration. Earlier, you had mentioned a 20 percent reduction in income. What is the primary cause of that? Uh, economic decline. Uh, the uh, the no jobs factors are very... There, there are several factors which are contributing to the economic decline. One of it is uh, dysfunctionality of the banking sector. Before that, the fact that this, the budget of the Afghanistan has gone down two third, by two-thirds. It was a $13.5 billion budget. It's now about $3 billion budget with $1 billion deficit. We don't know how much of it was filled in. So uh, the, the loss, the real-time loss of the economic sector is huge. Um, continued continued uh, effects of the droughts com compounded three years and all that. So um, all the, the hardest heat sectors are, uh, I would say, 45% health sector, uh, dining and lodging, 38%. Education, 27% reductions, if you want to be uh, more specific. Construction sector, reduction 48%. Non-food manufacturing, 18%. Um, Non-agricultural sector, in general, contracted uh, most considerably. Thank you very I much. I hope that gives you a little bit yes, more thank details. You. Thank you. Uh, if the guy? Thanks. Hello, uh, can you hear me, uh, Farhan? Hello? You are audible. Please give your question. Okay. Uh, 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 my question has been actually asked by uh, Edi, but let me ask you. Uh, uh, you, have, uh, you have underscored the shortage of funds uh, to, uh, to, uh, uh, to the UN mission, but off and on we hear uh, several countries, including neighboring countries, offer, uh, providing uh, humanitarian aid to Afghanistan. Is that being handled by you or directly it, it goes to the uh, Taliban? And how much does, difference does it make? Thank you very much. Um... You know, neighboring countries uh, 
they work each each neighboring country works in a different ways, uh, and the way they contribute to the relief efforts in Afghanistan is different. Uh, it is absolutely important the role of the neighboring countries. What Pakistan, Iran, uh, let's say uh, Uzbekistan. Uh, have been doing in terms of border trade, organizing the markets, and uh, providing access for the traders to cross the border and transport in goods and supplies and those type of things is very valuable as an economic way of supporting the communities. That comes uh, probably uh, very much hands in hands with donations because also the countries of Central Asia, uh, Kazakhstan specifically, and, and ours have been also giving uh, wheat and, and food assistance. The way it is being distributed is very different, right? Uh, some of it goes through uh, OIC, um, Islamic uh, Conference Organization. Some of it goes directly uh, to uh, the communities. Some of it is being implemented through the NGOs or uh, Red Crescent societies of those countries. And some of it is being distributed through uh, Afghan Red Crescent Society and institutions like this. So I, it, it's very varying from one country to another. Uh, the type of assistance being provided is also varying. For instance, uh, Turkey was providing uh, food, uh, non-food items, clothes, but also uh, helped in planting trees and, uh, and training uh, air traffic controllers at the airport and things like that. Um, all in all, uh, support of the regional countries to the people of Afghanistan is absolutely essential. It has been critical and takes uh, different forms than the traditional aid is, also because these are neighbors uh, and, uh, and there's a, a lot of issues uh, related to um, the economic uh, well-being on the both sides of the border and things like that. I hope I answered your question. Thank you. Thanks. Okay, and uh, we go back to uh, Mariam. Thank you. Um, I actually, um, part of my question was um, asked by Batul, but I have a follow-up question. As you know, recently the Taliban arrested some of the uh, women's rights activists in Kabul, and um, your office had been uh, directly involved uh, to um, get some information from the Taliban and uh, find out uh, what actually had happened and um, try to free um, those girls. Um, the last... Um, uh, piece of information that I got, it was that you requested some information from the ta and Taliban. Um, I was wondering if you got any answer for, uh, from the Taliban and uh, if your doing office is um, specifically doing anything to protect um, Afghan women's um, rights activists. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, this is an important question. Uh, our uh, offices uh, engage in all cases which are referred to us or brought to our attention, and we do engage with the de facto authorities uh, to make sure that uh, women rights activists uh, which are detained or experiencing any other restrictions are um, are safe, secure, and their rights are assured. In those cases which you referred to, we have directly followed up with the de facto administration of Afghanistan on all questions, also requesting the access to the detainees, uh, the clarifications on the reasons uh, uh, of the detentions, uh, and requesting access for the family members, and, uh, and making all required follow-ups as to the, uh, to the existing protocols. We continue to maintain uh, that the freedom of expression uh, is an essential human right, uh, that women's rights are absolutely central uh, to the future of Afghanistan and to the um, uh, human rights agenda in Afghanistan, and they have to be observed, and they have to be protected, and they have to be respected. This is our position. This is what we've been taking up in our uh, daily contacts with the de facto administration. Thank you. Are, are there any further questions? Yes, I have a question, please, Farhan. Gloria, uh, I care a lot about Afghanistan. I have followed them, sir, probably for 30, 40 years. And I admire that you're still there, that they haven't asked you to leave. They're not being easy. My question, couldn't the United States put up a letter of credit 
for the human needs of Afghanistan that the United Nations has to dispense, that it's coming from their monies that's held by the United States in a form of a letter of credit that for human rights can be used and distributed by your organization. Thank you very much for your kind words of support uh, for the UN in Afghanistan and to the entire humanitarian community, which is standing in solidarity with the people of Afghanistan. That's what they need from all of us these days, more solidarity, because uh, people of Afghanistan are not uh, guilty of anything what happened here for, for all this time. Um, I cannot comment on what uh, member states should or should not do or can or cannot do. What I can say that uh, we at the United Nations uh, would probably uh, not be involved in any way or form or distribution of any aid or any money which is uh, from the frozen assets or from any other source uh, other than a volunteer contribution. Uh, in all of those processes, we will remain uh, operationally independent from uh, the sources of funding which are otherwise uh, are a subject of a dispute or some sort of, um, uh, uh, let's say, restrictions uh, to impose on it. And that's where we will remain. Uh, that we has we have I've been asked those type of questions very often. And what I keep saying is that our ability to remain here, our ability to be able to speak, to deliver messages, and our ability to reach to the people is based on the fact that we remain operationally independent, a neutral and impartial humanitarian actor on the ground. And it is within this realm that we remain, and, and that also determines type of funds we receive uh, and type of assistance we provide. Um, other than that, of course, uh, uh, I would strongly encourage uh, all the good people and all uh, good willing uh, individuals uh, around the world to continue to support Afghanistan and all the member states who have been very generous. And United States is, is remaining to be the, the top donor of uh, our humanitarian basic human needs assistance to the date. Uh, including also, of course, our top donors, United Kingdom, European Union, Germany, and, and uh, then obviously uh, countries of the global north, Nordics, uh, and, 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 and there's no little contribution or big contribution. Uh, every contribution is important. But uh, again, uh, I remain um, uh, very grateful to those countries who have made the most generous contributions to Afghanistan, again, United States, UK, Germany, uh, European Union, uh, and all of those I listed before, uh, very strong supporters. We, we are grateful. Thank you. Thank you very much. Uh, and I have no further questions, so I'd like to thank uh, Ramiz Alakbarov, the Deputy uh, Special Representative and Resident and Humanitarian Coordinator uh, for Afghanistan. Thanks very much, and uh, good luck on your work ahead. Take care. Thank you very much, Farhan. Thank you. Bye-bye.